welcome to another session of Conversations with the Mayor and what's become an annual event are Conversations on Revere Beach during the week of the Sand Sculpting Festival. We were talking earlier about how long this has been running. We know it's 20 plus years. We're not yeah. sure exactly how many years, but it's been running for a hell of a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, thanks, Ed. It's always great to sit down and have a conversation. And yeah. usually our half hour, or hour goes by in a zip. So. Before you know it, it's over and done with. And we have a few things that, that, that to talk about today. First and foremost, we'll talk about a little bit about the Sand Sculpting Contest. But um, more importantly, in, in each time we talk about we talk about how more it's become a prominent part of Revere's image. Every year it gets better and better. And now with all the development that's taken place down the beach and post COVID, because everybody's had kind of a, a, a breather away from sand sculpting. We had a little bit of one last year, a teaser, so to speak. And now it's coming back full force. You want to yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, week of weather that we have ahead and uh, it's just a it's an energetic event, right? And we're early on in the week, and I can already feel the energy from folks uh, about how excited they are to see the sculptors back here. And, uh, you know, with great weather, great sculptors, and, uh, you know, some beautiful artwork. With, it's, it ends up being the, the center of the universe for, for a weekend and yeah. for a week. And uh, I, what I'm really uh, excited about and what I love this year is the addition of flags. I saw that, that drive it up. Visible. Yes. And, you know, when you talk about our community and how uh, we've always been a welcoming and inviting community, uh, I can't think of anything better than the visual of having flags from all over the world represented and in the artists who come here. Um, kind of sh being proud of where they're coming from and where they're representing, but also feeling like th they have a sense of home here yeah. on Revere Beach, on America's first public beach, and to be welcoming and open to these flags and having that visual of people from all over the world are now coming to Revere and staying in Revere and yep. eating and drinking in Revere is really exciting. Yeah, you know, and, and you met, and, and, I, and I said the San, the. the annual sand sculpting festival and it is the international sand sculpting Correct. festival and these flags show how much international it truly is you know and and this festival is the premier festival i think of the summer but but not to speak say that it's the only one because we have bought you on the beach coming up in august um there was the the kite festival i mean the revere beach partnership has a number of things we've got i think music on the beach every week now and we have movies on the beach every week yeah, that's correct. so there's just so much going on here you want to yeah we've really tried to activate Revere Beach. Obviously, this is a crown jewel and, and a gem for the community and for the region. And it's a place that a lot of people can come and recreate uh, during the summer months. And to be able to really double down on, on the fact that we should have events every weekend, I think I think all of us have talked about that and, and kind of known it, right, intrinsically. We know it, 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 it is a place where you can come and, and enjoy yourself with or without an actual event happening, yes. right? But uh, it was really important for us as a city to think about, okay, how do we get to the next step, the next level? And with all the development that's happened and with all the, uh, the uh, people that are now here uh, and uh, with all the attention that we've gained uh, throughout the last couple of years, it, it's really been uh, uh, kind of magical to see movies on the beach, music on the beach, uh, just events like the bocce the, the, the bocce tournament and obviously this is the crown jewel uh, and you know next year we'd love to you know I'm gonna tease a little something but we're we're hoping to have a food festival um, come down here and we've, we've been in talks about that uh, potentially happening on Revere Beach so we're gonna continue to see new events pop up and you know we're gonna have a great fireworks display uh, this weekend but we'll have another fireworks display later on in the in the uh, in the next couple of months and it's just kind of really thinking about intentionally having those events, having this be a place that people can enjoy themselves and yeah. uh, have a great time. Yeah, and and connected to all of that, it was, was a, another recent announcement that I thought was a great idea and I'm so happy to see um, Charlie Jafrida heading up the travel and tourism, if I'm saying it correctly, effort. Yep. I've been part of some of those meetings and conversations and watched the emails coming out and I'm loving what's going on because I think that connected with this will will bring all of these up even more absolutely having that connection and again thinking about things strategically and thinking through how to be intentional about what we're doing and the uh, the ability for us to have the the um, the funds to to do that right so 
uh, we're able to leverage our federal relief dollars uh, into for economic development purposes and connecting all of the things that are happening through the lens of travel and tourism uh, and with the events, the restaurants, the development, all the things that are happening, really making the city and the beach be a great place. But it's not just about the beach, right? The travel and tourism piece, is, which is really important, is taking advantage of things that are happening in the region, right? So, and I'll give you two examples. One, the U.S. Open. U.S. Open this year, the Gulf U.S. Open happened at uh, Brookline Country Club. Yes. Uh, because of the fact we have three new hotels, and we have a num number of other hotels in the city, uh, we actually saw a great uptick. And to have the connection at a, on a travel and tourism level of putting the city on the map of a place when there are regional or national events that happen, that we get some of the, uh, the, the, the benefit of that is really important, right? So another one is the marathon. The marathon, uh, people don't think of the marathon as like as a as a travel and tourism, yeah, yeah. or that we have a place in travel in and tourism related to the marathon. A number of people were uh, connected to the marathon, uh, uh, either running in it or uh, working with it, were staying in Revere for uh, for that week, and so uh, thinking again strategically and making sure that we're connected to the things that are happening, not only in the city, but in the region, and that we stand to gain uh, tax revenue from it, that we stand to gain just as a, as a notable community, as a place where people want to come and want to enjoy themselves. Yep. And we have the, the, the beautiful beach that is a draw no matter what. It draws millions of people anyway. Uh, but if we can really connect uh, different, different pieces that are happening in the city, the restaurants and the hotels and and the development and new businesses that may want to come into the city because uh, because of all that's happening, it, yeah. it really ma makes a makes it a no brainer. And that was the other piece I was going to say because beyond promoting travel and tourism and people coming to the city of Revere, what's happening with that effort is bringing together of the nonprofit groups, the restaurants, and the various businesses, and all the groups in the city that have different things going on. That frankly, we're operating somewhat in different silos now. They're all somewhat operating in the same silo. Yeah, right? and Charlie's uh, engaged a stakeholder group, and this is why. Doing, doing things like, like launching a travel and tourism office may seem like it's not really criti mission critical to what the city does, but the ability to connect people directly and have, and have the, uh, the, the, the vision of what we want to do here and, and getting people out of their silos is really important. And you, you, know, you need staff to do that. You need people to do that. And, and Charlie's been great even engaging with uh, with everyone that has a, a part to play in terms of making the city of Revere a, a tourist and a travel destination. Yeah. And connecting those people has been really, really great. And it's already, there's already been some great benefits coming out of just those, something as simple as a, as a regular newsletter and a regular connection, a regular meeting right. for people to understand what is happening and how they can fit into it. Yeah, and just one last note on that because and it wasn't necessarily, and, and maybe it is part of what travel and tourism is doing, but another thing that I saw come out of that effort was in the very first meeting, we sat down and we talked about all the different events culturally and otherwise that could come up during the year and as a result of that came up with this list of events that can be used in this thing to disseminate information to not only groups within the city but departments within the city so that for example at the senior center Spanish Heritage Month we could do some Spanish heritage events to raise awareness about Spanish heritage and other departments in the city doing the same thing absolutely it makes it uh, more efficient more effective and you know, we're, we're really excited about the ability to, to, to kind of connect uh, different people who, uh, and different departments who may be working in silos uh, to each other. And, yes. and, and ultimately, it's a benefit to the resident, right? That's what we, what we want to do is make sure that we're uh, providing a, a value to the resident yeah. and we're, we're doing something that, that they can uh, feel good about. Yep. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit direction in, in terms of, an, and one of the other things that's going on um, in looking ahead to the development of the city, of course, is, is Squire Road. I just recently saw that there's going to be an urban planning workshop. And you think about Squire Road back in my day, I remember the airport. That was for us when we left, I lived in East Boston at the time, when we left East Boston, we went by Squire Road, Squire Road and once we passed that, we were in the country. <laughs> we're heading up to Maine. Um, and of course, it's, it's had a story 
storied history, but talk a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, Squire Road to some degree is like the, the last frontier, right, <laughs> in, in the city of Revere. We, uh, we have this stretch of, of road that uh, is really congested, uh, has tens of thousands of people that travel on it every day, um, really doesn't have uh, you know, a sense of purpose, right? There's, there's a lot of different things that you can do on Squire Road, but there's really no, the city hasn't, hasn't taken up it upon itself to say, this is what we want to accomplish on Squire Road. It's just been a hodgepodge of different uses, and you know, we, we, we haven't been really thoughtful about what Squire Road looks like. So uh, we were lucky enough to engage with the Urban Land Institute, who uh, actually helped us with, Squ uh, with Shirley Ave, and kind of came down and did a charrette where, a uh, charrette is a, a fancy word for a uh, planning exercise where people come all together and you get people that don't have a lot of, have a lot of experience, but don't have a lot of knowledge of the actual location that they're in. And they take their uh, experience from other places and apply that in an area that they're really not all that familiar with. And so getting people to really think outside the box about what Sky Road could look like uh, is, was really important for us just to get some sense of like, what, where should we be headed? Yep. Um, you know, how should we be looking at Sky Road? How should we be thinking about the future of it? And the big piece for me is when you look at Sky Road, uh, Northgate is just a massive piece of that, right? And Northgate was always a shopping center of the Goes city. Back to the 60s. And, I mean, it was the and 60s it was a model place of a that, shopping center. It was a place that everyone went. If you if you needed anything, you could go to you could go to Northgate and you could get it. We know that the future of shopping doesn't look like Northgate, right? Mm -hmm. So what should that look like? And and you know, we wanted to get some feedback from uh, stakeholders, so from the folks that own property around the area, the uh, elected leadership, so the uh, ward councilor and state rep and a few other uh, elected officials were involved as well. And uh, just getting a sense of like, what, what do we want Squire Road to be? You know, because it has a, a ton of opportunity, right? You, you have, number one, you have tens of thousands of people that travel on, on it every day. That's a, a built-in potential workforce, yep. a built-in potential uh, market, you know, for, for people to shop or, or, or do whatever. Uh, and then you, you, there's natural assets like the marshland that is kind of cut off from from anyone to to kind of see it either from a biking perspective or just a natural beauty perspective that, that is completely cut off. And and there is uh, you know an opportunity for us to potentially connect some of the neighborhoods that have been built up who, that have been built up without a lot of a lot of foresight, right? And I'm thinking of the Ward Street area. Yep. You know, yes. there, there's really yeah, you know, we have we have a part of this. Like we we have to reconfigure the crosswalks and look at how people access and get around that area. But uh, it's been hodgepodge, right? And so what we wanted to do is really take a little bit of a time out, say get some experts to come in, take a look at Squire Road, get us thinking about how uh, how that space can be planned out, and uh, hopefully we can get to a point where maybe we have some rezoning or we're looking about looking at how we attract businesses down there and uh, really make it a great place uh, you know a great little neighborhood that that it it you know it's it's had its day uh, and I think we just want to reimagine it and think about it for the future certainly and it's the right time to be thinking about it like I said it goes back to the 60s so we're looking at 60 years yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that it's been around and it's a different model now and and um just just to, so it, you're in the brainstorming session this is going to be some some long-range planning we're looking 10 15 years down the road or whatever but yeah it's heading down that path yeah and so the idea is you bring those folks in they they do a day a really intense day of of uh seeing seeing the area that they're that they that they're thinking about and then they came up with a report they do have like a a, a kind of shorthand report about some key takeaways, things that, that the city should be thinking about, mm -hmm. things that we should be teeing up from a, from a other a stakeholder perspective. Because Squire Road is a state road, right? Yep. And so that's another piece of it, yeah, yeah. that you think about the infrastructure. <laughs> and Donnie Charamella won't let me think about anything unless I think about the infrastructure. And he had a great point about, hey, if we want to talk about and think about what the future of this, uh, the, these sites and, and this area looks like, let's not forget about what's underground because what's underground right now is a uh, water line that's undersized, is sewer lines that are undersized and you know, utilities that, that need, need to be looked at. And he had a great point at one, uh, at one point 
uh, he was making the point about the water lines, and he said, um, you know, the 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 line, the water line under under uh, Squire Road has some ha has some issues, and he brought up a piece of it that they had to repair at yep. one point, and it was you know the tuberculation and some of the the uh, the deterioration of the of the pipe. And Donnie's a really you know he wants to see it and touch it and feel yep, it yep. and get other people to see it and touch it and feel it and be able to understand the importance of the things that we don't see. Right, like like infrastructure, like water lines and yeah. sewer lines. So, uh, yeah, really excited about about Sky Road. Yeah, yeah. Take another slight little switch, and and I'm going to talk about a gentleman, Dr. Perella, um, who you know, I know of, but don't know personally. But I've heard good things about him. But more importantly, the job that he's going to be fulfilling, and and I'm not sure exactly what the title is, but my understanding is that he'll be working with students throughout the school system to get them involved in maybe as interns and departments and nonprofit groups to help prepare them for the rest of the world. And I've always said, one of the biggest wasted resources in the city, and we do use them, but I don't think we use them enough are the students in our school system. Mm. And this just, it was one of those things that I said, hallelujah, finally, this is going to be great. So talk some more about yeah, that. Yeah, so I'm really excited about the appointment of Dr. Dr. Perella. Dr. Perella is going to be the Director of Youth Engagement and Success uh, for the city. And, uh, you know, the the bottom line for us is uh, we want to make sure that we're preparing our, our young people for a successful life. And that doesn't just mean that they go to school you know, five days a week and, you know, uh, you know, for, for several months out of the year, uh, we, ha we have, as a city, I have a responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything we can both in school and outside of school, right? And so the mindset that I wanted to, to bring to the city was, hey, we're, we're invested in the, the success of the young people in our city, and it's not just up to Dr. Kelly to, to figure that out. And I've had these conversations with Dr. Kelly and, and a lot of folks at the state and, and even national level around education have talked about how the, the system of education that we have right now is set up to you know, effectively produce uh, factory workers, right? And so the way that we're teaching students and the way the, the tools that are at their disposal, we're, we're you know, we're making progress and I think this is just as a whole in public education and education in general we're making good progress and we're you know Massachusetts we're ahead of the curve than a lot of other other states in the country but at the end of the day there's still these kind of fundamental institutional things that we do that don't really set our kids up for success and so in a innovation economy in an entrepreneurial uh, uh, economy being able to say to, to, to kids, hey, there are opportunities for you that out, may out, lie outside of your normal school work and your normal school day uh, is really exciting. And to think about how we can connect what we're doing uh, in, from a workforce development and economic development standpoint uh, to what we're doing from a health and wellness standpoint and a health, uh, health and human service standpoint, uh, it really is a holistic approach to the young people. And I say all of this knowing that we're coming out of COVID, right? And so of all the most vulnerable populations that we've had to, had to help, our, our young people have been affected. And, and we haven't really truly seen the impacts of, of what they've been through for the last couple of years. We need to be ready for what that looks like in the next you know, year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and we should be planning for that. And that's not, again, not just the responsibility of Dr. Kelly and the school district. And so what, what uh, John has been tasked with is saying, number one, this is a really big idea, right? Big, big, uh, big idea and something that's not really necessarily concrete, but there are certain steps that we can take immediately. Uh, so what he's working on is, uh, forming uh, a, a youth cabinet, which is you know effectively a way for us to look at all the stakeholders, all the people who have some piece of a, a young person's success in our city, and say, hey, how are we all collaborating, right? Because again, go back to silos, right? And f folks that you know, people may not think that workforce development has anything to do with uh, with gu guidance counselors or school education, but 
there's there are these massive connections that need to be made and to have somebody like John making those connections is really important and convening you know a group of of stakeholders that will be working on behalf of young people and really thinking about how we how we help them as a as a kind of get into the into the world the other piece that he's uh, uh, been really focused on is in, is engaging youth right and having direct conversations I, I can have all the thoughts in my you know my head about what's going to be impactful for a young person but there's nothing better than talking to them ourselves right and getting it directly from the horse's mouth and hearing directly from them and hearing you know what is it if we if you know and I'll give it a great example we're getting a health and wellness uh, center Kind of stood up. We're gonna. Uh, I announced it at my state of the city, the Robert J. Haas Health and Wellness Center for the city. Uh, we want that to be a location that's multi generational. We haven't heard from kids what they want to see there. What's going to attract a kid to go to go there? Mm -hmm. And so that John is doing that work to actually get focus groups, get people involved, get them engaged, understand really w what will be impactful for them. What like what would be helpful. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to have that. And John has such a great connection uh, in, in the city with so many stakeholders, with so many students. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's been at the middle school level. He's at the high school level. I actually had him my senior year of high school. So uh, my senior year of high school, I had both Dr. Kelly and Dr. Perella and, uh, as students or as, as teachers. And, um, you know, to be able to be uh, thinking about these things and, and uh, putting them into place and having somebody like John, uh, who's got such a great track record, being able to uh, be at the forefront of this work is really right. exciting. You're right, and, and and you know, and that's the other part that I didn't hit on in the beginning. And I talked about using the resource, getting them a little bit more training and education, getting out in the world. But the the other really important part of that is them being involved, having a voice, and feeling empowered about being involved in decisions within the the community and so forth. And you know, frankly, going forward, being a part of the community Absolutely. as a result They're of that be involvement leaders. and that commitment. They're going to be the leaders of the city yeah. at some point, right? And so we have to prepare them for that. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, I, I got to go back uh, again. We'll, we'll switch down to it. We'll take another track off. Um, and and uh, a subject that, that, that's that been um, not a positive, if you, but, but, but something that I think positively in my mind, I think you've handled well. But talk a little bit about 370 Ocean Ave because we, I know personally from the people that I've worked with at the senior center and being close to the Board of Health, how how devastating that that fire was, and 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 the work that you've done. If you will, stepping out in front and knowing that there's only so much I think you could do. And I'm not trying to make excuses, but I mean, at least my perspective. But talk a little bit about yeah. where we're at with that and some of the things that recently you've done. Yeah, the fire at 370 has been absolutely devastating, and uh, it's been really challenging and first I I am so uh, grateful and appreciative that we have such a tremendous fire department and one that was able to uh, respond so quickly and make sure that everyone was uh, safe uh, because if that had that fire happened at 2 a.m. or had we not had a, uh, a fire watch which was required in that building and had the fire department not acted quickly uh, in identifying where the fire was and and be able to get up there and, and to handle it, uh, we wouldn't be talking about just the displacement of, of residents. We'd be talking about a mass casualty event, and that would be really tragic, yep. uh, incredibly tragic. And so what, uh, unfortunately, what we're dealing with now is, is a property owner that really has, um, uh, I, I'm actually at a loss for words to really explain how frustrated, angry, and upset I am about about. Uh, the ownership of that of that uh, property, uh, but they have just at every turn been ignorant to the situation that people have been in uh, for the last month now, close to a month. And you know we're we are stepping up to provide uh, help and resources for those people. Just last week we said that uh, you know I'm going to use emergency funding and my ability as chief executive to make sure that the the, just the, the small dollar amounts that, that the people are entitled to, that those residents are entitled yeah. to by the property owner, that they're, that they're not providing uh, to their tenants, the city will cover, right? So by mass general law, uh, anyone who is displaced from a fire uh, and you're, you're renting, you are, you are uh, legally 
uh, of you know able to get seven hundred and fifty dollars from your right. from your landlord. Uh, the Carabetta family has said no, we're not doing that unless they break their lease. Unless these residents break their lease, we'll give them seven hundred fifty dollars. Now people are in leases and they you know they have security deposits and they have first and last yeah, yeah. and all those kinds of things and to think that people are going to break their lease for seven hundred fifty dollars yeah. is at, like incredibly stupid, right? And so. Uh, you know, at every point when we've asked uh, the Carabetta family, can you relocate? You have a number of units, all not only on Revere Beach, but in the region. They have yeah. buildings in uh, Malden. They have buildings in other cities. Can you find other units to help uh, relocate some people? No, we're not doing that. At every turn, they've, they've just been uh, uh, really difficult to work with. So we are taking the next steps and saying, okay, what we, what we need to do is make sure that there's a long-term solution here. Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that they're held accountable for all, all of their inaction and the, the little bit of action that they have taken. And I'll give you an example. They ripped out all of the, a, a bunch of carpet in, in the building. I, I took a tour with uh, District Attorney Kevin Hayden. And we went in there and, and we could see, as we looked down from the building, you could see that there were carpets laid out uh, on an adjacent property. And we asked what, why there was carpet left hanging out. And they said, well, we're going to dry them and see if we can reuse the carpet. You know, and so those kinds of actions, right? It's the inaction of not providing, you know, certain things. And then the action that they do take is really detrimental, right? Yeah. Uh, they're not, they haven't done any of the work that they needed to do. When I did a, um, when I did a walkthrough, they, they didn't have anybody actually working in the building. Now, if I own that property, uh, and I think if any reasonable person owned that property and you wanted to get people back into that building and you wanted to get it fixed, you'd be working night and day. You'd yep. be asking me, hey, can I work 24 hours a day? Can I, can I have 100 people in there? And when we walked through, there was nobody there. You know, so, so at every turn, we've really been, uh, we've, we've, we've met, we've been met with obstacles. So we are taking it to a, a level that, um, that I don't think anyone really has done. Uh, you know, uh, some other cities have done, but we've never done um, in, in our city in terms of acting on re potential receivership, receivership and, uh, and, you know, taking uh, uh, other actions on the other properties that they own because they are, you know, in tax title. And they're, they're like, there's so many, there are so many um, legal procedures that you, you know, you have to go through, That's which are incredibly frustrating, earlier. right? right. For, <laughs> for red, like, I hate red tape, right? Um, I, I look at what we do as, you know, a, a, in some ways as being uh, entrepreneurial and we can be really flexible and we can do lo lots of really interesting things. But when you have to deal with red tape, people are saying, well, why don't you just, you know, how could you let it get to a, the point where there are $2 million in taxes owed? Well, if you don't pay your taxes, you have to, there's a process that we have to go through. We can't just take your property. Right. Just like we can't take Mrs. Jones's house up on Reservoir Ave, like, you know, really quickly. There's, when people have more resources and they have lawyers, they're able to go through a process. And what we're trying to do is cut that down as much as we can. Yeah. Hold people accountable. Get the right people involved, right. like the district attorney, like the attorney general, yeah. like the, you know, uh, folks at the state level to be able to really say, this is a problem. We need to solve it. And at the end of the day, we want people. I want people to be able to live on the beach at a reasonable price. Yep. Right. That's what these buildings, you know, provide for a lot of people. We want that. We want it to be safe and we want it to be in a place that is beautiful. And yeah. right now that's not the case. Yeah, and we could be sitting here talking about this one all day long, but I did want to get your thoughts on that and, and an update on where that's where that's going because it's it's so important. And like I said, I've got at least one senior that I know of and I've met a couple of other people and I think it was her last day in a hotel the other day. I know she was talking to your office and it's tough. You know, yeah. what, what, what can you do? Because number one, there aren't enough houses around. And that brings us to probably one other subject that I wanted to talk about was the inclusionary housing zoning ordinance. And I know the city council didn't pass that recently. Yeah. And um, I've read some recent articles about how the uh, the state house has kind of passed the ball on to another to another governor when that next governor comes in and which which takes away money that could be drastically used for all of that. That's a tough situation. But what, what, what? Yeah. Yeah. So and for those who are watching who may not know, um, basically inclusionary zoning is uh, a policy that the city can uh, implement that would require that 
when a development is being built that a certain percentage of the development be allocated to, uh, to affordable housing, right? And so affordable housing it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but, and that's where the details come in. But generally what we're looking at were uh, people who were within 60% of the area median income, which again, a fancy word, but really comes down to if you're in a, uh, a you know, one family household, I forget the dollar amount. Um, I, th I wanna say it was around maybe 45 or 50 or $55,000. Uh, and if you're a family of four, it's like $85,000, which anyone knows if, you're, if you have a family of four, and you're living on $85,000 as a household income, it's really difficult, right? It's really hard to find housing. We know that 40% of the, of the residents in our city are burdened, are house burdened, so they're paying you know, more than uh, more a than third half. of their, uh, of their yeah. income to, uh, to, to housing costs. And, uh, and so what we, what we proposed to the council was something that we had worked a, a long time on and we had worked with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council on. Uh, and the feedback that we got was that, you know, there were some concerns about uh, a, a few things. One was the the sizes of the of the developments, right? So we were asking that anything over uh, six units be be included in this inclusionary zone, zoning policy. Uh, and so the council, I think, wanted to wanted to increase that so that smaller developers and people that are doing small small units or small buildings wouldn't be as impacted as buildings that are a lot bigger. When you have a two or 300 unit proposal, that can really have an impact and you can get, you know, if you can get 20 or 30 units of housing that are dedicated to uh, folks that are um, in the affordable housing kind of bracket, then that's, that's a real impact. Uh, so there was there were a couple of, there was some feedback. Uh, what I have what I have heard is that there is an appetite for the council to, to do something. You know, it's just going to be finding out what that is, and they weren't really interested in having the conversation. I don't think publicly. Okay. So so we're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to bring a few of our um, uh, uh, of our, uh, our colleagues in uh, local government together and figure out what what appetite people have for uh, certain things. And the other, the other part of it is that uh, the benefit, you know, to, to somebody who's building um, in the city would be that they would get certain uh, offsets. So they would be allowed to do certain things that they otherwise would have to go through a process to, to obtain. So, you know, uh, certain restrictions around parking or around density are, uh, you're required to go through a process to, to, get, to get granted mm -hmm. those um, the, the, the ability to do certain things. Um, and we would waive that in lieu of providing affordable housing. So there was, there was some pushback on that as well because of the, uh, the, the issues with parking in the area, in, in the city, uh, and some of the challenges that we have around parking. Completely understandable, something that we can definitely uh, kind of work through, and I look forward to working with the council on that yeah, yeah. And, and, and having and, something happen. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, that was one of the things I did read in the article was that a few of them commented as much as to say, well, in the manner in which it's written, I can't support it, but if something were changed, and they didn't specifically say what that is. So that's what you're talking about, going back to the drawing board and kind of having yeah, those discussions. Yeah, I think so it'll, be, it, it it'll have to be uh, uh, more units, right? So or like the, the, the developments that are required to to implement an inclusionary zoning policy would have to be a bigger, big, like the bigger units that are over maybe over 20 or over 50 or over, you know, 75 units. Uh, and then uh, we'd have to look at the percentage. I've heard people talk about 10% instead of 12%. Those are minor, you know, and then parking, like I said, was another, was a give back that we'd have to, we'd have to take a look at. Yeah. Um, moving on from there, um, and I'll go on to um, recently um, you completed um, an effort working with people from the community to repurpose the McKinley School. Talk a little bit about what came out of that process and, and what's going to happen there. Yeah, so this is really exciting. Uh, we've worked with Mass Development, uh, and Mass Development is a state agency that held cities and towns and private, uh, private interests kind of work together on using public land and uh, interesting uses around public land. And uh, what we're planning with uh, McKinley is to really think about a couple of different things. One is 
making sure that we are providing a great, uh, a great location for early education. I've heard from Dr. Kelly and from the school district that the, the way that we do early ed would be uh, much more efficient if we had one central location. So uh, there's, there's a need there uh, and we can certainly uh, we can certainly use that space to, to provide some of, of the, the need there in terms of centralizing early education and thinking about how we, how we you know, uh, really do good by the young people, really young people in, in the city and, and by the young families in the city and making sure that there are hopefully maybe even additional spaces for young people to, really young people, uh, to be able to, to come in and get educated. The other piece is community uses. And, you know, I think, um, I, I don't think anyone has uh, uh, pushed back on the idea that we don't have many, uh, many meeting places. We don't have many Amen. places where there can be cultural events. We don't have, uh, you know, entertainment venues, kind of th those kinds of spaces. We have them in the schools, but they're not really, they're not really public, you know, um, accessible you know, right. buildings and uh, so what we're, what we're planning for is and what uh, Mass Development helped us think through was looking at the, that building, how, what the program of uses could be and effectively what kind of came out was you could use a first floor and a half as, uh, as early education space, right? So we would, we would relocate all of our early ed uh, classrooms in that building and then the other, other you know, floor and a half, we'd be looking at uh, community uses. That could range from uh, kind of open spaces that could be, uh, like I said, uh, entertainment venues to uh, smaller spaces that where you could have uh, a maker space, right? You could get a, a couple of 3D printers and you could have people making things, right? Or you could, you know, potentially have innovation centers, yeah, like a little, like a little innovation hub, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be a very. You don't need a huge yeah. uh, space to do that. You could do that in maybe a couple of classrooms, or if you knock down a couple of walls in a classroom, you could have that kind of space. So, uh, it's really, it's really exciting. We have to. So the school district has uh, dedicated or earmarked a certain amount of money from their federal funds to to help with the renovation. The city would also have some money to be able to throw at that. Uh, now that we've gone through this process with mass development, the next, the next kind of step is for us to either get some uh, information from potential, uh, potential uh, uh, kind of companies that could come in and help us do this, right? Other stakeholders that could help us uh, provide, provide these kinds of uses, or uh, we, we kind of take that next step our, on our own and say, you know, we're gonna we're gonna start looking at the feasibility of re, uh, reconstructing or uh, renovating that building, yeah. and so that we're it's a, it's a great location. It's you know right around this right, right around the corner from City Hall, but very walkable and could be a great location for uh, for a, a, a few different uses that are really community oriented. Yeah. And the last thing, and, and I know we're getting near near our time, and, and we probably may not have enough time to discuss the whole thing, but um, HYM and the project at Suffolk Downs, which is probably the biggest project to take place in the Suffolk County area, if I if I remember reading correctly, yeah. and uh, forever almost. But um, two things. I want to start off first off in terms of where they're at, what they're because you see all this construction going on, and my understanding, phase one, there's residential, there's possibly a hotel, and then of course there's the life science building, and let's talk about that last if we have yeah. enough time, because I know that's a major subject and a major issue with people, but where are they now in the development? So they're, uh, they're under construction, right? So uh, the, the work has begun, they've pulled their permits, they've, uh, they've got the infrastructure work that's being done right now, um, and we will start to see buildings coming up out of the ground, uh, if not later this year, early next year. Uh, and so that's really, it's exciting, right? And, and you were part of the, the uh, Suffolk Downs advisory, advisory. group and um, the amount of, of uh, feedback and input that we received and we got about, about this project and making sure that we were really uh, positioned well to, to benefit from what's happening in the region and 
uh, all the great things that are happening in, in, in our own backyard. And so uh, we're really excited about the fact that, that they're moving forward and that, they're, that buildings will be coming up out of the ground. Yeah. And uh, I've actually had the opportunity to be on site at Suffolk Downs, not, in not near the construction, but more towards the track, you know, the track area where uh, they've tr tried to activate some space down there. And you see how big that, uh, that property is yeah. and you just get a, a sense of, you know, what, how, how really transformational that, that uh, project will be uh, to the region and to the city. Uh, and, you know, finally, we'll talk about the lab because I know it's been yeah, it's something really that everyone has been yeah. talking about. And, you know, we, uh, I go back to the fact that uh, what we want to do is uh, draw economic opportunities for our residents, right? Which and was a, a big benefit here because there wasn't supposed to be any commercial building until the second phase. Right. And we, we set it up so that we were going to get a, at, at least 50% uh, commercial uh, right. uh, 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 kind of square footage or usage uh, out of that site. And when I know folks are pushing back on the idea of life sciences and the idea of biotech companies, uh, but what we've seen is a lot of really misguided uh, and unfortunately uh, intentional misinformation about what would happen or what could happen there. Uh, some of that's politically no motivated, no doubt. Uh, some of it's also just, I think, good people hear bad things and they they tend to run with it you know and so the idea ultimately will be to have a space that will be a headquarters what nobody's talking about is we're not talking about some lab that's just gonna be you know uh, 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 kind of run in the shadows it's not uh, gonna be and Wuhan and it's not gonna be <laughs> Wuhan which I've heard you know a million times what we're talking about is a flagship headquarters of a biotech or a life sciences company that you know is doing tremendous work to hopefully save lives for people right. right and the investment that went back and what what people what's been lost i think in a lot of tra lost in translation for a lot of people has been you know uh over a decade ago governor patrick at the time made an investment a million dollar a billion dollar investment in life sciences and the life sciences industry as a whole uh, knowing that we have tremendous higher education uh, institutions here, knowing that, that there's a great workforce here. There was a, an intentional investment in life sciences you know, a long time ago. And the seeds that were planted back then have sprouted and we have these incredible businesses that are, that are generating uh, really uh, life-changing medicine for people and that we are the center of that because of that investment that was made. People may think it's a government conspiracy and people can think of, you know, all these crazy wild fantasies about what's going to happen there, of what, you know, what is happening and how, how this all aligns as some, you know, kind of uh, Illuminati, you know, conspiracy. But really, ultimately, what we're looking to do is provide, provide great economic opportunities for our residents, generate tax revenue, and have a place that people can come through our school district and go work to, right? Right now, we, we and you know this, Ed, our economy has been built, and I've talked about this a bunch, our economy has been built historically around a couple of racetracks. It was built around, you know, now it's built around the hospitality industry. We see more restaurants and more hotels popping up, which is Tourism, great. Right? We don't have a long-term you know, uh, and not that we want to be a one company kind of uh, town, right? right? And we have we have a couple of Amazon yeah. facilities, which is which is good. They they provide jobs for for people, but what we're looking for are those are those high end, higher end, economic uh, kind of uh, viability and and uh, opportunity, uh, job opportunities for people that are in the six figure range. You know that people can can get a great job and you know ideally I want kids to go through our school district go off to college and then make the the decision to come back to Revere because they can work here and they can live here yeah. right people right now aren't coming back because they want to work here they're coming back because it may work financially or there may be you know they may be attracted to the beach and they they want it this is where their home is or their family I want people to be able to, to yeah. work here and have really great jobs and Providing 50% of of Suffolk Downs as a commercial district yeah. and as a commercial 
uh, 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 opportunities for our residents, it means that people will be coming back here to work here. And, and having landing a biotech or a life sciences firm to come and have a either national or international headquarters and plant a flag in the city of Revere, which is something that I don't think I ever thought that I would say, but it's something that, that could be a reality, is a good thing. And people can't be, can't be uh, misguided and, yeah. and given bad information about what that means for, yeah. for the city. And, and the other part to it is, is that when you look at, at, at less regulated um, uh, industries within the city, um, some, in, in some respects, the, the risks and the impacts of a disastrous event in those industries are probably just as bad or far worse from an, or an industry that's very highly regulated and less prone to having those sorts of things. The one last thing on that though, um, is, and it's important because there's, the, the mindset is that, hey, everybody's mind is made up, we're getting level three, um, and, and that it's a done deal, and you know, people you know, get their hands in their pockets, whatever. Um, my understanding is, is that it's still a zoning committee. I don't think there's been anything that's come out of zoning committee. They're deliberating on one and two, maybe three. Can you fill us in a little bit on where that is and what the next step Sorry. Yeah, I believe that Council, Visconti, Council President Visconti and Council McKenna had a, an amendment to our ordinances that would uh, drop that level down to a level two. And so I know that's, I, I believe that's what what's being debated. Uh, unfortunately, there were some people that were showing up to, to, the hear, to the public hearing about that, about the change of it going down to a level two. You know, advocating for it to go down to level two, but not knowing that there was actually that was actually the 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 motion that was being presented, right? They were they were arguing with the council yeah. to do something that the council was kind yeah. of looking to do. So, um, so yeah, that's been my understanding that they, they that they have that uh, that that's on the table as a potential op uh, option. Uh, I think there'll be I'm sure there'll be some more conversation about yeah. it. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that there's no doubt the city will do what it needs to do around regulations, around policies, making sure that the Board of Health is looped in, making sure that we're drawing from the, the people who know these things. Like everyone says, and you know, I hear, I've, I've watched the public hearings and I've, I've been to a couple of them, and you know, people say, well, you're not a, you're not a doctor, you don't know, and, and you're not a specialist, you don't know. We, we draw from the talented people who do know. And so when we draw up uh, regulations and we draw, draw up policies, we're going to take the experience that people have and we're, I'm, you know, I'm not going to write those myself. We're going to get people who know them to yeah. write them and uh, to make sure that they're protecting the residents at sure. the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's the most important thing is that we're protecting our residents and they know that we're working on their behalf, yeah. right? And we would never let something happen that's going to... Uh, be right. dis disastrous in terms of a, a, a bio uh, hazard or, and, or anything like that. And you've that. got the models of Cambridge, Arlington, Somerville, and all those areas around that have some much more serious labs at this point so to use from. So That's correct. At that, we're, we're going to end it because I know we're, we're in each in the end, reaching the end of our time. We could go on all afternoon, Brian. Thank you, Ed. Once again, thank you so it's much. A it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, until the next time, take care. <laughs>